Okay, so chapter four. If you were in class, I would see your face, right? So there shouldn't really be a problem with me seeing your face right now. Um, chapter four starts by talking out uh, talking about probability density functions. So let's write that down. So, let's say you have this graph, and it might look like anything, who knows, okay? And this might remind you a tidbit of calculus, where you're like, I want to know between these two points, A and B, right? And so, You are trying to figure out the area under the curve between these two points. Well, in this class, the area under the curve represents a probability. So the probability that some value is going to fall between A and B, as you know from calculus, is the integral from A to B of the function. Oops. Okay, so in words, what we're saying is, let me type it because I know my handwriting sucks. Okay. In words, what we are saying is the probability that X is between A and B is equal to the area under the curve between A and B, right? Should seem familiar. And just note that, of course, uh, because we're talking probability, if we were to integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity of our function, then we would get one because all the probabilities add up to one. Okay, so we're going to talk about something called the cumulative distribution function. Okay, and what we are saying here is the probability that something is less than or equal to some value is equal to the integral from negative infinity to that value okay because we're doing less than right of the function so in words we are saying the probability that x is less than some number is equal to the area under the curve to the left of that number. And then graphically speaking, visually,
we're saying we pick some uh, like breakoff point and we're saying everything up until that point. Now, because you know everything adds up to one, you can always use the complement rule. If you wanted to the right of it instead of to the left. So if you wanted to the right, using the complement rule, the probability that your number is, sorry, it's dumb that they use two X's, but they're using like a capital X and a lowercase X. Uh, the probability that it is greater than that number, you use the complement rule and you just do one minus the probability you got before. So in words, let's see. If I can probability that X is greater than some number is what we're talking about. So we're saying it would look like this instead of the above graph, we're wanting everything else. So we're saying that's the starting point, not the cutoff point. We want everything to the right. how to use this thing. I, I used to think I was tech savvy, but I am not anymore. Annoying. Um, okay, and then also, if I wanted to find the probability between two numbers, I could look at it as can I put it maybe Everything to the left of B minus everything to the left of A. Okay, so if I want the area between two points um, and we are using 
the cumulative distribution function, which only defines the area under the curve to the left of some number, but we want it to between two points, then we are going to just do to the left of the rightmost point minus to the left of the leftmost point, and that'll give you the delta of the in-between shape, the shaded in between those two numbers. Or if you want it to the right, when the cumulative distribution only gives you to the left, then you're going to use the complement rule of one minus the uh, probability. Questions so far? Okay, so remember the area under the curve represents some sort of percentage. So if we have a graph Let's say this number is 10. And we are shading everything to the left of that. And I told you, Scott, I know there's more colors than this. Did they? If I told you that the shaded area under the curve is 0.75, P is 0.75, probability is 0.75, then what that means is 75% of the data in whatever our example is, is less than that number 10. Uh, another way to word it is to say that 10 is the 75th percentile of the data. So 75% of the data is less than 10, which would mean 25% of the data is greater than 10, right? So it is the 75th percentile. So whatever percentile they say, percentile implies less than, which means 75th percentile means 75% of the data is less than that number 10. Here's an example, which is crazy. My son, um, they have like growth charts when your kids are born and you take them to the doctor and stuff. Um, there's these statistic growth charts that show how much a baby should weigh or how tall they should be or whatever. My son was in the less than one percentile, <laughs> which means 99% of babies weighed more than him. He only weighed more than 1% of all the other babies, right? Um, if your baby's in the 50 percentile, that means 50% of babies weigh less than them and 50% of babies weigh more than them, okay? So the percentile represents what percent is less than. 
and you can, of course, gather by the complement rule in your brain, that means that the opposite is true, that 25% is greater than 10, if you know that 75% is less than 10. Questions so far? Okay, let's talk about the normal distribution. So a few uh, things to know about the normal distribution. The first thing to know is that it is symmetric about mu and mu squiggly, meaning the mean and the median. <laughs> it's bell-shaped. And it has inflection points. at mean plus or minus sigma. So what it would look like is if you had like this timeline and you said, okay, here is the middle, then this would be the mean plus one standard deviation. This would be the mean plus two standard deviations. And this would be the mean plus three standard deviations. Or going the other direction, you'd be subtracting So minus one standard deviation, minus two standard deviations, or minus three standard deviations. It has inflection points. What does uh, the word inflection point mean to you? Harken back to, have you taken calculus two? Inflection points. Is it a change of direction? Uh, yeah, so it's where the concavity changes from up to down or down to up, right? Concave up, concave down. So we have inflection points at mu plus sigma and mu minus sigma. It's bell-shaped centered about mu so concave down concave up concave down concave up Okay, so there is something that we call the z-score, which just represents the number of sigmas you are away from the mean. So you see how we're counting plus one, plus two, plus three sigmas away, or minus one, minus two, minus three sigmas away to the right or the left of mu. So the z-score is how we define how far away we are from the mean. So it's the number of sigmas plus or minus 
you are away from the mean. So how many tick marks are you away to the left or the right? And then we also have the p-value, which is the corresponding probability according to where you are on the chart. So it's that percentage that corresponds with the z-score Of course, visually, it's the area under the curve that we've been shading. At this point, I would encourage you to open up your book if you don't have it open yet. So go grab your book or go open it up virtually. Um, I have a note here to see table 8.3 on page A-6, so let's go look at that. Page A-6, I think, A meaning appendix. Um, how do I get there? Maybe I just need to... Appendix tables. So go to the appendix tables and turn to A-6. So make a note. C table A.3 on age A-6. In the book. So this is what the table looks like. You should have your own book open as well, but this is what the table looks like. And so you'll see um, they have a little key here at the top. They're reminding you that the zero mark for Z, like no distance from the mean is a zero mark. And then to the right is positive and to the left is negative, of course. And the area under the curve is that shaded area, which is the probability. So the Z scores can be read here. This, for example, is negative 3.40, negative 3.41, negative 3.42, 3.43, etc. And these decimal places here on the inside are the probability or the shaded area under the curve. Now, this is a two-page table because these are all the negative values for Z. And then if you flip to the next page, these are all the positive values for, for Z. So you'll see on the left-hand side, there's barely any area under the curve past negative 3.4, that makes sense because we only drew our picture to three sigmas anyway. And then to the next page, there's uh, pretty much 100% area under the curve once you reach 3.49, right? Um, that would be almost 100% of the area under the curve. Okay, you're going to be working a lot with this table, so if you have a physical book, maybe put like a tab on there so you can turn to it quickly. Or if you have a virtual book, uh, just remember what page it's on so that you can find it easily and quickly. We're going to do an example uh, working with this table, so again, make sure you have your book out. Let's do example 4.13. For the virtual book, I believe there's a bookmark page button on the bottom right that you can click on to bookmark the page. Cool. Example 4.13 
on page 158. So turn to page 158 in your book. Example 4.13 is towards the bottom. And it's just practicing working with the table. So it just says, let's determine the following standard normal probabilities. So here is the problem statement. You should have your book out, but just in case I also pasted it into the chat. So part A, it says the probability that Z, oh, that's fun. When I copy paste, it didn't save any of the signs. So that's not gonna be helpful for you, sorry. Uh, the probability that Z is less than or equal to 1.25. So the way you do that, you start by drawing a picture. This is not optional. You should always draw your picture. And you can just leave tick marks like 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And you draw a line of what they're talking about. So they said 1.25. So you're going to draw a line at 1.25 approximately. Less than or equal to means you're going to shade to the left. And then you are going to go find the probability. So you're going to write P equals and you're going to use the table. So go and see if you can use the table. Go turn to the table that we were just at and find the Z of 1.25. Remember, you want the positive Z, not the negative Z. So go to the positive side. Go to 1.2 on the left and then go over to the 0 0.05 section. So 1.25 and see what that probability is. Tell me what you get. Good, 0.8944. So you'll label your z-score here. You'll shade either to the left or the right, and you'll label, you'll label your probability. And in this case, it's 0.8944. Uh, questions about that? Let's try B. B says the probability that Z is greater than 1.25. So again, you draw a picture. This time we want greater than, so we're gonna shade to the right instead of to the left. So we want that area under the curve. How do we find that area? The complement rule, very good. So we are gonna do one minus the probability that Z is less than or equal to 1.25, which is what we got from the last problem. So one minus 0.8944 is equal to what? Zero point one zero five six. Then you go label it in your picture. Questions about that? So just make a note to yourself that you need to always draw the picture and show your work like we just did to get full credit. 
questions? Let's try part C. Part C says the probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 1.25. Someone walk me through this. What should we do? What's step one? Draw your picture. Very good, let's draw a picture. So how should we draw? Of course you start with that basic timeline. We wanna put Z in the right spot, which is actually negative 1.25. Which direction should we shade? The left side. Correct, and why is that? Because Z is less than or equal to negative 1.25. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we want to label that probability Go ahead and use the table. What do you get? Again, you get 0 0.1056. So note the symmetry. Wanting greater than 1.25 on the right-hand side is the same as wanting less than negative 1.25 on the left-hand side, right? Because it is a symmetric graph. Uh, so just note the symmetry. Part D, they want the probability that Z is between negative 0.38 and positive 1.25. So, so this is one of those situations where Oh, that was terrible. What should I do? How should I draw it? I think you have to create A and B. You have to do what? So like, like two points. Uh-huh, two points. Very good. So let's draw a line at both places. Negative 0.38. It's like here-ish. And positive 1.25. That's like here. Then what? You got to shade the middle. Shade the middle. So 
So we're looking, whoops. We're looking for this probability. Look back at your notes. How do we do it? Probability of 1.25 minus probability of negative 0.38. Yeah, very good. So visually speaking, what we are going to do is figure out from the table what the whole, whoops, what the whole probability is to the left of the rightmost point, that entire area, and then subtract out the area under the curve to the left of the leftmost point. And that'll give us the shape in between. So go ahead and use your table. Tell me what you get for the probability of Z is 1.25. Zero point eight nine four four. Do the same for Z is negative point three eight. Zero point three five two zero. Now what? We we just subtract this from each other. Very good. You're just going to subtract them. So the probability is equal to 0.8944 minus 0 0.3520. What do you get? 0 0.5424. Very good. Questions about that? Part E talks about finding the probability that Z is less than or equal to five. What do you do first? You gotta draw the picture. Thank you, draw the picture. What direction are we shading? Shading it to the left. What's that probability? Yeah, so Alina had a question from the last section. Um, do we have to draw out the two new graphs to subtract the probabilities, or can we just write out the equation? You want to do both things. So exactly how I'm showing my work, you should show your work.
Go to the table. What's the highest Z score the table even gives you? Yeah, so the table doesn't go that high. Um, but what is the area under the curve to the left of 3.49? What area is that? Nine 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 eight. Like, if we round it at all, we'd be at a hundred percent, right? So essentially, especially if we're going even further out than three point four nine, we're going all the way out to z is five. We can basically state that the probability is all of the probability under the curve is to the left of z is five. So essentially, it's the entire area under the curve after you get to the highest number they give you of 3.49. So we can say that our answer, the probability is one. So you go back to your picture and you put one. Question so far? Now you can also use this table backwards to do percentiles. So like you could go in the middle of the table and try and find, for example, the 75th percentile and then sort of back your way up and look at what the z-score is. So make a note. You can use this table backwards to find percentiles. So let's try one. Um, what is the z-score for the 75th percentile. So you're going to go in the middle of the table and try and find the closest thing to 75% or 0.75, the closest thing to 0.75. And then you're going to go up and to the left and look at what the z-score is that corresponds to that 0.75. So tell me what you get. Very good, approximately 0 0.68 or 0.67-ish. So we'll just say approximately. Questions about that? Okay, so to figure out what your z-score is in terms of your problem statement, you want to try and figure out how far away it is from the mean in terms of numbers of standard deviations, right? So you're going to take your number that you're looking at, subtract the mean, because that'll figure out the distance you are away from the mean, and then divide it by sigma, because that'll say in terms of standard deviations, 
one tick mark, two tick marks, three tick marks, left or right, it'll tell you how far away you are from the mean. And that's your z-score. So use this equation to essentially standardize your number to get that z-score so you can go ahead and use that table. So use this equation to standardize. So again, we can only use that table if we have a z-score. How do we find the z-score? Well, remember the z-score represents the distance away you are from the mean in terms of numbers of sigmas, plus or minus to the right or the left of the mean, one tick mark, two tick marks, three tick marks, etc., or anywhere in between in terms of numbers of sigma. So x, your number, minus mu, the mean, that's the distance, divided by sigma, which is how many sigmas you are away from the mean. Use this to standardize it so that you can go ahead and use that table A-6 um, because A-6 only deals with z-scores. So you need to find your z-score in order to use that table. So let's do an example. We're going to do example 4.16, which is on page 162. So turn to page 162. Four point one six is kind of towards the top. It says the time that it takes a driver to react to the brake lights on a decelerating vehicle is critical in helping to avoid rear end collisions. The article suggests that reaction time for an in-traffic response to a brake signal from standard brake lights can be modeled with a normal distribution having a mean value of 1.25 seconds. So mean, what symbol is that? What variable is that? Mean. mu. So we can write mu equals 1.25 seconds. And then it says a standard deviation of 0.46. So what symbol is that? Sigma. So we write sigma equals 0 0.46. It says, what is the probability that the reaction time is between 1 second and 1.75 seconds? So the way you write that down is they are asking me for the probability that my value x is between 1 and 1.75. That's what we want. So before we standardize it, this is what our graph looks like. We have our mean, which is 1.25 seconds, and then we have each standard deviation. So what's 1.25 plus a standard deviation? What's that new number? One point seven one, and what's the next tick mark? Two point one seven, and what's the next tick mark? Two point six three. Questions about how we got that, those numbers? Okay, now go to the left. Start at the mean and start subtracting the sigmas. Okay, yes. Yeah, so what we're doing is we're literally remember in uh, our graph, it's 
mu and then it's mu plus sigma and it's mu plus two sigma and it's mu plus three sigma, right? So now we're going to go over here and do mu minus sigma, mu minus two sigma, mu minus three sigma. Okay, so what do you get to the left? 1.25 minus 0.46. What do you get? 0.79, then what? 0.33, then what? Negative 0 0.130, which you would have to be, in the context of this problem, some sort of robot to react in a negative amount of time. That wouldn't really make sense, right? You would have to somehow predict that the person in front of you is going <laughs> to put their brake lights on. Uh, so we're talking about between one, so somewhere right here, and 1.75, so somewhere right here. And we want to know what that probability is. But as you know, the table doesn't have a table based on reaction times of hitting your brakes. The table is only based off of z-scores. So you can't have infinite number of tables for infinite number of, uh, of studies, right? You have to be able to standardize your numbers so that you can use this one table. So what we do is we're going to take our reaction times, our 1 and our 1.75, and we're going to convert it to z-scores. So for example, if I wanted the z-score for the 1, I'm going to do 1 minus 1.25 over 0 0.46 to plug it into that z-score equation. So what do I get? negative 0 0.54. Now what does this mean? This physically means that we are to the left of the zero mark, to the left of the mean, 0.54 sigmas away, right? So this means 1 is 0 0.54 standard deviations to the left of the mean. Someone walk me through how am I going to calculate the z-score for the 1.75? What should I plug in? So we're going to do 1.75 minus 1.25 divided by 0 0.46 and what do you get? Approximately 1.09. Someone interpret that number to me. What is what does 1.09 mean? It's 1.09 standard deviations to the right of the mean. Very good. The 1.75 second reaction time, right? 1.75 is 1.09 standard deviations to the right of the mean. So what we're going to do now is we're going to draw in terms of z-scores what we actually want.
Okay, so we're going to draw our z-scores on our graph now. So we're going to go to negative 0.54, which is here-ish. And we're going to go to positive 1.09, which is here-ish. And we will shade in between. And the question is, what is this probability under the curve? So what should we do? Look back at your notes. What do we do? Okay, correct. You're going to take the probability of the upper limit and subtract the probability of the lower limit. So visually speaking, what you're going to do Oh, I drew this backwards. I'll fix it in a second. Okay, so the area under the curve is going to be the area under the curve to the left of the rightmost limit minus the area under the curve to the left of the leftmost limit, okay? And that'll give you visually the area in between. So go to the table and tell me what areas you get for each of those. Go to table A-6. Go look at the area under the curve to the left of Z equals positive 1.09. What do you get? Zero point eight six two one. What do you get for the other one? Zero point two nine four six questions.
Y'all are pretty quiet this morning. Grab some coffee. Wake up. Turn your cameras on. Questions about how we got this? Now what do I do? How do I find the total probability that we're looking for? Subtract, very good. So you're going to do my probability is 0.8621 minus 0 0.2946. So you get what? Zero point five six seven five. Go back to the problem statement. What does that number represent? What statement can you make in words? Bring that into the context of the problem. Someone want to take a shot at it? Maybe go back and look at other examples that we've done. Use it as something you could base this answer off of. What's the plan? Are we just have a staring contest this morning? Hello, Earth to students, say something. Is my audio not working? Or have you not woken up? Thank you. Okay, at least a question. Here we go. Can you remind me when to shade to the right or to the left? Okay, so if it says less than, then you're going to shade to the left. And if it says greater than, then you're going to shade to the right. But in this example, we wanted in between two numbers. So you're going to shade in between those numbers. Now, the table itself that we're using only gives you the area under the curve to the left. So you have to base it off of the table and say, well, if it's only going to give me the total area under the curve to the left, then I have to kind of geometrically piece it together and take everything to the left of the rightmost limit and subtract everything to the left of the leftmost limit so that I can actually get the in-between area. Other questions? You know, when you take the test, which is coming up here soon, you're not going to have me or your buddy to answer this. So that is why we try and practice together here in class so that you can flex that muscle. The probability that a value is between 1.25 and, well, how would you get negative 0.38? Wasn't it one second and 1.25? One point, it was 1.75 seconds and one second, right? But... Yes, that's the basic idea. Um, there is a 
percent chance that reaction time will be between one second and 1.75 seconds. Um, does this have to do with the, the standard deviations to the right or the left? The per percentile of the data. So the what the percent represents, you always want to just go back essentially to what the question asked. So I know we did this last time, so you might want to go back and refresh your memory, but the question was about stopping time, like how long it takes someone to stop a car when they uh, see an object in the road or something. And they wanted to know what the probability was uh, that someone would take between 1 and 1.75 seconds. So given the information that they gave us. So you can do all this work, but if you get a number and you don't know what it means, then kind of useless. So go back to the problem statement and say, what did they ask me? What am I trying to work out? And then bring it into the context of the problem and say, okay, well, what this number means is that there's a 56.75% chance that the reaction time will be between 1 and 1.75 seconds. That's what they asked you for. Okay, if you can't answer it, then I mean you're no better than like like a like a Excel spreadsheet or 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 a monkey that can enter in numbers, right? You want to be smarter than Chat GPT, and you want to interpret interpret the number, bring it into the context of the problem. What does it mean? Okay, don't just spit out a number because a calculator can do that. Okay, questions. Okay, let's talk. Now, listen, this can be challenging at first, but you will get good at it as long as you just do more practice, okay? So just find more problems like this or go back and do the problems we did in lecture and see if you can write the sentence yourself. That's the whole point. It's uh, what you can do is go to the problem statement. It'll say, what is the probability that such and such happened? Well, the number that you get, that's the answer. This is the percent chance that such and such will happen. That's how you answer the question. You go back to the question and essentially rephrase it. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about the empirical rule. So the table that we've been using is applicable to everything because you can just essentially convert anything to a z-score and use the table. But there are times that you could get an answer even quicker if you wanted, and I'll show you why. Like even not even having to use the table that we use. So there are uh, boundaries that this graph can be broken up into. So let's just sort of draw like dashed lines to break up the area under this curve. And we'll talk about how much area is in each section of the curve. So here there is 34%, here there is 34% because remember it is symmetrical. And then you have 13 and a half percent, 13 and a half percent, 2.35 percent, 2.35 percent, and 0.15 percent on each end. So let's say someone wanted to know what the area under the curve was exactly between negative one and one. Well, you would just piece it together and add it up. So what would you get? 68%. 68%. 68%. 
Very good, Alan, 68%. And then let's say I wanted to know how much area was under the curve between Z is negative 2 and Z is positive 2. What would I get? Nine, oh, 95%, sorry. Uh, just negative two and two. What do you get? Oh, sorry. Wait, negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got 95%. 95%. Okay. Yes. 95%. And then what about between negative three and positive three? Uh, 99.7%. Very good. Now, uh, you might actually hear someone call it the 68 95 99.7 rule it's just a mouthful so it's also nicknamed the empirical rule and the reason it's called the empirical rule is that um a lot of things in life are actually arranged like this if you have if you gather enough data a lot of things will fall under this bell curve this normal bell curve so what i mean by that is we expect the average student to get a c right which means actually that we expect 68 percent of students to get a c Okay, and then we expect the next 13 and a half students to get a B and the next 2.35 students to get an A and barely 0.15% students to get like an A plus, okay? And we've got Ds over here, Fs over here, and F minuses right there. So if I took enough students, like let's say I took all the Sac State students taking this class, not my class, but just everyone's class, then uh, you would fall in the curve somewhere like this. Okay, so be careful when you ask a teacher, especially a statistics teacher, to curve a test because actually curving a test means I'm going to take the middle 68% and give you a C, no matter what grade you got. And I'm only giving 13.5% a B and uh, about 2.5% of the students an A, okay? So you'll notice that the bell curve, the majority of the area under the curve is in the center. And so if you are truly curving an exam, we're pulling everyone from the ends into the center. Now, if you're on the wrong side of the curve, if you're getting an F, you'll be happy because you might be pulled up to a D or a C. But if you got an A, but a lot more people got higher A's, you might get pulled down to a B or a C, okay? So you don't always want a test actually curved <laughs> or a class actually curved. Um, my dad told me he he went to this one school that um he was able to it was like it was weird it was like anyone could go to the school but then the very next year after he got in it it became where you had to apply to get in like you it was a very competitive but for some reason he got in before they changed that rule so then he was in class with a bunch of very smart students because they had to compete to be enrolled in that school and what happened was he ended up on the bottom end of the curve all the time so even if he was let's say getting a c and being an average student he would end up getting a d or an f because there were so many students that were doing better than him um, because of the way that I know Alina was so sad and he said he'll never forget he had a teacher pull him aside and say that he was the <laughs> the most hardworking F student that they had ever met. <laughs> it was so sad. Um, but like so when you ask a teacher, I know when you ask a teacher to curve a, a grade, you should really know what you're asking them to do. Um, now, most teachers, if they're not statistics teachers, they may not even really know about this or think about this. So when you're asking them to curve it, really what you're saying is, can you just like knock off some points off the top and make it out of 80 instead of 100? And then that helps everyone because it shifts everyone over to the right hand side. But that's not a true bell curve. This is a true bell curve. Okay. Ranking you essentially amongst your peers and then placing you somewhere under the curve. 
Um, but anyway, it's called the empirical rule because empirically speaking, a lot of things normally fall in this curve if you get enough data. Okay. So uh, the reason this is useful is if the um, if the question asks you for a z-score that's exactly on one of those tick marks, then you don't have to even go to the table in the back. You can just piece it together. So for example, if I wanted between tick mark zero and tick mark two, what would you get? Forty-seven point five percent. Right. You just add it together. Or if I wanted between negative one and negative three, what would you get? Fifteen point eight five. Right, so you just have to add it up. So you can get the answer a little quicker than flipping to the back of the book and um, using the uh, Z table. However, if you use the Z table, you'll get approximately the same answer because of course these numbers are rounded. Those numbers go out a little bit more decimal places. So um, either one will be acceptable like on a quiz or an exam though. If you find that the question is asking exactly on a tick mark, you can just add these up, but make sure you write on your page like by the empirical rule, Rule, the answer is blah and you could say 34 plus 13 and a half equals you know 47 and a half percent or whatever so that's how you would like show your work versus the other way how you have to use the z table like we've been going over so of course this is really only applicable if it lands exactly on a tick mark otherwise you're going to have to use the z table anyway you know if you're at 1.5 or 2.36 or whatever when would we use the 0.15 well alina if i asked you what is the probability that you're going to be greater than three then that's the 0.15 percent or what's the probability you're less than negative three that's the 0.15 percent okay which is why we talk about how the majority of the area under the curve is between negative three and positive three you see how the curve works it's asymptotic towards the x-axis right so it does technically keep going and going and going but it, it approaches the x-axis so it gets less and less and less you'll see if you add it up between negative three and three you have 99.7 percent of the area under the curve so if we're talking realistically speaking we're about a hundred percent there uh, once we get to negative three and positive three other questions so just make a note to yourself that you can use the empirical rule uh, if the question asks you about exactly on a tick mark, one, two, three example. Okay, you can just add up the areas under the curve. So just write that down in your notes so you remember what that is for. So that was just a little sidebar. Um, and we're going to do one more example before we finish chapter four. Example 4.18 on page 164. Does someone have a question? I thought I heard someone turn their mic on. Okay, if you don't have your book out yet, go open it up to page 164. Turn to page 164. We're going to do example 4.18, which is at the top. The authors of Assessment of Lifetime of Railway Axle used data collected from an experiment with a specified initial crack length and number of loading cycles to propose a normal distribution with a mean of 5.496 millimeters. What variable is that? What letter? What symbol? Uh, 
I don't know the name, but it's like the U. Like the, uh, yeah. The little tail. Uh huh. It's the Greek letter mu. Mu. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It looks like a, like a cursive U almost, but if you squint and tilt your head, you can kind of see how it almost looks like a really fancy capital M. So that might help you remember mu. Uh, it's an M. Is it a U? What is it? It's a mu. 5.496. Um, yeah, you didn't realize when you majored in engineering that you would also learn a whole new alphabet, <laughs> but you will. You're going to learn all sorts of Greek letters. Um, okay, so when we keep reading, it says uh, standard deviation of 0.067. So what symbol is that? Sigma. Very good. The reason I do it this way is this is, in my opinion, how you should do it. When you're reading, you should take notes, underline, highlight, circle things so that you can pull the numbers out and know what they mean. Because I know a lot of times for engineers, when you see a bunch of words, you're just like, ah, where do I start? Get rid of all these words. So pull the numbers, extract the numbers out of the words so you can make sense of it to your brain. Um, they're saying that the random variable x represents the final crack depth. For this model, what value of final crack depth would be exceeded by only 0.5% of all the cracks under this, these circumstances? So you have to interpret that and go, what are they asking me for? Well, they want an actual crack depth, okay? but they want a crack depth that's exceeded by only 0.5%. Okay, so if you're thinking of Graphically speaking, first of all, what does the word exceeded by mean to you? Greater than? Yeah. So we're going to have something way over here on the right-hand side. And which direction should we shade? To the right side. To the right. And be careful. Take a beat. What percent is right here? 0.15? Or it was 0.5? Yes, it's 0.5% or what decimal? Zero point zero five. No. What? What percent? What do you convert 0.5% into? What decimal? Zero point zero five percent. No. Well, you said 0.5%, 0 0.0005. That was too many zeros. Wait, it's zero, zero, 0005. Okay. It's so funny that this comes up. I was just having a conversation with my husband. He has a small business uh, and he uses Stripe. And Stripe, uh, I guess during COVID, they offered like discounts um, for small businesses. Well, now that COVID is over, they sent him an email saying, we will now start charging you 0.5% every invoice you send out. And he freaked out because he did the math wrong because he did what you guys were doing, 0.05. So he was doing the math. He goes, every time I invoice, I'm going to have in his head giving 5% away, not 0.5%, which made a big difference because he invoices for, you know, two weeks to a month at a time of his salary. And he was like, I don't want to use Stripe anymore because I'm going to have to pay them, you know, 300 bucks every time I send an invoice when in reality, it was like, 30 bucks, <laughs> which still he can choose to not use them if he doesn't want to pay $30 as a fee, but it makes a big difference, that decimal point, okay? Um, so how did, let's see, this was given. Now, remember though, when we go to the table, the table only gives us the area under the curve to the left. So what would that area be? 99.5. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. So it would be 100% minus 0.5%, right? Which ends up being 99.5%. And how do we write that in decimal form? 0.995. Sorry. There we go. Zero. You're right. 0.995. Questions about that? 
So why did I figure that out? Why did I care about the 0 0.995? Why did I need to find that? Mm-hmm. Because Alexandra says because of the Z, and the reason is, is the Z table only gives you to the area to the left. So even though the problem statement is talking about it being exceeded by and the correct drawing does show shaded to the right and that percentage, in order to use the table, we also need to know the complement of that to go ahead and use the table. Okay, so all of this was essentially given in the problem statement, even though it wasn't, it kind of was. You can infer what they're asking you. Uh, how to use that, that Z table. Okay, so we're going to use the Z table a little bit backwards, kind of like we talked about percentiles last lecture, where you can go in the middle of the table and find the percent you're looking for and then use that to figure out what the Z score is that represents that mark off. Okay, so go to the table and tell me what Z score is that break off point between 99 and a half percent and then a half a percent to the right? between 2.57 and 2.58. Good, and it's uh, actually like exactly in between, right? So we can assume the Z is 2.575. Now, if it's not exactly in between, you can do one of two things. You can interpolate, like you can do linear interpolation to find the exact Z score in between, or you can just figure out which one's closest, like is it the lower one or the upper one, and use it, okay? Questions about how we got that number? I'm a little lost. Can um, yeah. So, did you go to the table in the back? Yes. Okay. Now we're we want to know the Z score that has the percent to the left 0.995. So you're gonna look in the middle of the page with all the decimals and try and find the closest number to 0.995 in the middle of the page. And once you find that, then kind of back out and go to the left and go to the top to figure out what Z score that represents that corresponds to. Got it. Okay. Other questions. So remember the equation is Z equals X minus mu over sigma, but we have sigma, we have mu, and we have Z. So we're actually trying to solve for X in this problem. So you can go ahead and isolate the variable X, solve for X. And what would X equal if you rearrange the variables? X equals Z times sigma plus mu. Perfect. Questions about that? Okay, then just plug it in. X equals Z sigma mu. What do you get? I got 5.67 rounded. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So we already kind of drew the z-score graph, but if we were going to kind of go backwards and draw in context of this problem, remember the mean of, of the uh, crack depth was 5.496, and we are over here at 5.669. And we are claiming that only half a percent is greater than that crack depth. So remember the problem statement said exceeded by only Okay, so try again. Go back to the problem statement. Someone better try this <laughs> now that you're awake. Go back to the problem statement, see exactly what the question asked you, look at the answer that we got, and see if you can write a sentence. Bring it into the context of the problem. What statement can we make? Given the circumstances of this model, the final crack depth that would be exceeded by only 0.5%, uh, or final crack depth of <clears throat> exceeding only, exceeded by only 0.5% would be 5.67. Very good. And include your units. So a final crack depth of 5.669 millimeters would be exceeded by only 0.5% of all cracks under these circumstances.